So now we're ready for part two, right? Because you just can't slam into population health. I mean, we, you got to know where you've been to know where you're going. You're only going to improve what we measure. So you better pick what you're going to measure pretty carefully. That's the theme. So we're going to answer in part two a couple of questions. What is all this stuff? Where did it come from? How does our school interpret it? Not that we have the only answer, although, you know, I like to think that. Not probably accurate. And what's the etiology of population health? So here's the message. The first time we could trace the term in the peer-reviewed literature is 35 years ago by Dr. David Kindig, still alive and working at the University of Wisconsin in Madison at their Institute for Population Health. He coined the term population-based care 35 years ago. So this is a, a new term. Here's Trustee Magazine now almost two years ago, right, Summer? First time it was a cover story, so trustees, you've heard about this, and our school was featured in this cover story piece. So here's the definition in kind of three easy-to-digest pieces. And this is Kindig. If you'd like the reference, please go online, K-I-N-D-I-G, and you could drill deep into David's work. It's really fantastic. But basically, Population Health says the following that there are health outcomes and they're distributed within a population and some of the measures of those outcomes could be morbidity, mortality, or the one that I've given to you this morning, number 17 in the world after Slovenia with regard to quality of life, part one. Second part says, well, that there's certain determinants that influence this distribution and those determinants include medical care, for sure. That's 15% of the story. So St. Luke's and Jefferson, we contribute 15% of the story with regard to the determinants that drive the outcomes that contribute to the quality of life. I'll show you a picture in a minute to clear all this up. And the other determinants are socioeconomic status, crime, pollution, smoking, behaviors, and my favorite, of course, is choosing your parents wisely, really important. The third, peer, the third tier sort of says that policies and interventions influence these outcomes, like the Affordable Care Act. So let's simplify all of this and give you a picture. So it's basically a diagram of what I just said. But here's the take-home message almost for the whole morning. Here we are, you and me, in our work role. Medical care is 15% of the story. The other 85% is this messy stuff like poverty, <coughs> drug abuse, out of wedlock pregnancy, smoking, obesity, pollution, no place to exercise, can't afford fresh food. I mean, on and on we go. Violence. Let me give you some examples. Philadelphia, sixth largest city in our country. In the nation's top 10 cities by population, Philadelphia is the poorest. That's right. So the founding fathers never could have anticipated that Philadelphia, fifth or sixth largest city, but in the nation's top 10, the poorest on a per capita basis. Half a million children go to sleep hungry in our great city every night. Our school system is failing. The Eagles did not make the playoffs, <laughs> right? 25% of adults still smoke cigarettes, national average hovering 16, 17%, right? OK, I could keep going. It's depressing. Half, half of all school children in the public schools, K through 12, are obese, half. Now, that's a population health time bomb that you and I are going to pay for. So medical care, the uh, episodic, acute, and chronic laying on of hands, that's 15% of the story. The other 85% is what you're trying to do in your community and what we're trying to do in a way more complex environment. What's our community in Philadelphia? People go to 45 zip codes when they leave our front door. So population health, in a nutshell, is, uh-oh, a big job. 
if health care, the actual laying on of hands is the 15%, the population health agenda is the other 85%. Now, that was a great slide that you showed that Mark Chasson drew for you and was shown by your chief operating officer, you know, right. So the intervention, do you want to do bariatric surgery? So we've got a huge bariatric surgery department with all special lifts to get the 500 pound people on the operating room. And we have some wonderful surgeons with good outcomes because they have a lot of volume. Is that the answer? Gosh, I hope not. But that's what we get paid to do. Philadelphia, four medical schools, we've got three helicopters that race to the Schuylkill Expressway to snack up the trauma victims. We have three cardiac transplant centers, not a one of which makes its Medicare minimum national average number of cases. We have so many open heart surgery programs, I've lost count. Should I keep going? We have three National Cancer Institute programs <coughs> supported by your tax dollars in our town. Sure, they do great research, I get it. But I'll show you some data in a minute, you'll be scratching your head. So the population health agenda, you know, this is like, um, it's almost un-American. Right, you know, are we, do we really want to get into this together? Poverty, drug abuse, racial issues, education, what does that have to do with health care? Well, the answer is everything moving forward. So this is the sea change. Are we ready for it? We'll get that to that in part four. You know, but this, don't kid yourselves, this is the sea change that we're bumping up against right now. And some of it is you know, a head-on collision. Let me give you some more background. So this is a slide deck <clears throat> that we used from a webinar with this fancy consulting company in Chicago called SG2. Details not important. Board members, there's a couple of take-home messages in here. So lots of places, not yours, not yours, but lots of places that I visit say, we're ready to do population health. Let's just you know, jump right in. Well, I would argue, like we did in this webinar back in the fall, you know, the vast majority of health systems don't have the operating scale, the cultural characteristics, a sophisticated delivery model, partner availability, systems in place, I mean, it, it's not like you're going to throw a switch to do this. And, and yet, you're in the right direction, reorganizing your governance, getting organized with your community partners. You're, you're, you're in the right road, no question. But let's not kid ourselves, this is going to be gut-bustingly difficult hard work. And let me drill a little deeper and you'll see why. Okay, so when we opened our school five years ago almost, I realized, uh-oh, we don't have a textbook. How could you have a school without a textbook? Makes no sense. So we're already in the second edition of our book, Population Health, Creating a Culture of Wellness. When this book first came out, now almost three years ago, my then hospital CEO, a good longtime pal of mine, said, wait a minute, David, what, did you have to put that on the cover? <laughs> right? Creating a culture of wellness, what did that mean? Fewer admissions to the hospital, of course. Right? So this is, a, this is the cultural disconnect. Here's our scholarly peer-reviewed journal. So I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who here reads this. Right? By the way, the title to this journal, Population Health Management, we've had for a decade. Even though reform is 2010. We've been at this way before it was popular. So board members, who reads population health management and reports back to you about the latest findings nationwide? I'll let you ponder that later in the day. This is a handout available to you at the front desk from the Governance Institute. This is basically, don't tell anybody, this is the cliff notes for the textbook. Six pages is all you got to know. Six pages, all summarize the whole textbook. Don't tell any students I said so, but it's all in there. Group, we work with, not responsible for this report, but I wanted you to see the subtitle, right? A Healthier America 2013, this is, this is a year old report, but read that subtitle. Strategies to move from health care, you know, from sick care to health care, right? That's the punchline. How are we gonna do that? Realign the economic incentives, practice based on the best available evidence, ask patients what's important to them, engage with the community, I'll give you a whole list of what we gotta do. Now. 
back when David, Pate, and I, and Courtney, and we were, I read your strategic plan weeks ago, you know, you get it. And connecting to the triple aim is a laudable strategy. And I applaud you for doing it. And it will get you where you need to go. Among the challenges we have are, what are the right measures that will promote the triple aim? So board members, I think in your early tenure post reorganization, among the challenges that I think would be fun to engage with you more would be, well, what exactly are the measures to demonstrate success in implementing the triple aim? One more time, what are the right measures to demonstrate implementation of the triple aim? At this moment, I don't have the answer. I have some ideas and certainly our colleagues Matt Stifel and others who wrote this report have ideas. We published the executive summary of this report in our journal because I was so taken by the notion of connecting the triple aim to population health. More on that in the question and answer period. For our public health colleagues in the community in Boise, what they resonate with is this, the leading health indicators or uh, where we're going to be in uh, uh, 2020 population health indicators for 2020. So can we connect smoking cessation, obesity reduction, nutrition counseling, all of the goals within Healthy Nation 2020, public health speak, can we connect that to, can we connect that to population health? And I'll show you a picture of this in a little while. So these are the kinds of reports that are important. Now I know that you have leaders too, and I'll show you, just hold on, this is a lot of fun. Okay, so I stole this from Sue Denser at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This, of course, Michelangelo's David. This is the American version <laughs> of his famous sculpture in Florence, Italy, right? I mean, spectacular. So let me show you what goes behind this, uh, which is kind of cool. Okay, so we'll do another audience participation. Hopefully, I'll have more traction than I did earlier. So if you know the answer, don't scream it out, but this is, again, take-home message. So what percentage of adult Americans do all five of these things? They quickly go through them, exercise at least 20 minutes three times a week, don't smoke cigarettes or cigars, eat their fruits and vegetables like their mother taught them, wear a seatbelt, and number five will say are close to an appropriate body mass index. All right, so raise your hand. You got to do all five things. What percentage of adults, whole country, over 18, give me a number, what percentage do all five things? Regularly. Raise your hand. 10%, 1%, 7 Okay, drum roll, hold on. Okay, the answer is 3%. Okay, so let's take a moment. Let's take a moment to sort of think about this from a population health perspective, right? So I know you're in a Medicare shared, shared savings plan, so you don't have too much downside risk, which is great. So moving forward, do you want these people in your accountable care organization? I mean, yes. important, well, yes, if you could manage the margin, you'd do okay, good, good point, right? So here's our culture. Our culture is we're going to take our simvastatin on the way to McDonald's. <laughs> Part two. The government should pay for my simvastatin. I'll buy the Big Mac. <laughs> That's our culture currently. And, you know, we're going to be colliding with this in our accountable care world because you're going to get down and dirty with these behaviors that drive a huge part of the health of the population. So, again, a lot more on this we could get into in the question and answer. So let me show you some other things. So if I made rounds this afternoon in any one of your wonderful places, large and small, you know, I know that mortality at St. Luke's, just like at Jefferson, at least 40% is attributable to these four things, right? No question. Smoking, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and of course, uh, alcohol. And we could tie back at least four out of 10 deaths, inpatient deaths, to these four things. So we got to attack this at the root. Hard to do. We're not really paid to do that, right? So again, population health would say, well, the cost-effective approach to this is not in the inpatient setting. It's way earlier in the care in the community. 
Now, from a policy perspective, remember those policies, the third tier of pop health says policies have an impact. So the policy conundrum is, you know, we invest hundreds of millions, actually in the billions, for NIH type research when very modest amounts go toward chronic disease, care coordination, even of course, you know, there's no CPT code for care coordination. So this is a core problem that we face and again, part of the policy challenges that we're working on. How about that war on cancer? A lot of people looking around the room, you remember President Nixon, right? 1972, declaring war on cancer. We've probably spent, we're not exactly sure, you know, somewhere in the hundreds of billions of dollars now on this. When the core social change that smoking is gross, yucky, has contributed the most to cancer death reduction. The tipping point was making smoking socially unacceptable. Now we have those temples of technology doing unbelievable genetic level research in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia in particular. I wouldn't argue with that, but in terms of return on investment, the biggest return has been on smoking reduction. We're still at 25% in Philadelphia, much better than where we were even a decade ago. Other part of population health, this is exclusively for board members, so hold on to your hats for a moment, because I have to set you up for this. So this is a full page advertisement in AARP magazine. Regrettably, my wife and I are now regular readers. 52 million Americans read the AARP magazine. Really, the most recent issue, Susan Sarandon is on the cover. She's 55. God, it's scary. <laughs> anyway, so colleagues, you could read this, you know, the power to fight advanced prostate cancer, turn it on. So for the, our clinical colleagues, you recognize this, of course, is an ad for Provenge, which is uh, immunotherapy for advanced prostate cancer. Now, I, I, this is not a clinical conference, but here's the, here's the conundrum that we face. So this is a full page ad, in the AARP magazine to stimulate readers to go see their doctor to say, I'd like to get Provenge. Now, Provenge is a relatively new therapy, recently approved, paid for by Medicare, immunotherapy for advanced metastatic prostate cancer, horrible disease. You get three infusions of this, and it's $33,000 per infusion. So it's $100,000 for a course of therapy. The best research evidence says it extends life four to six months. So today's not the day to discuss the ethical and moral implications. That's not my point. My point is, this is a full page ad in one of America's most widely read magazines that is inducing demand for a very niche product that flies in the face of the best available science? Should we be screening for prostate cancer? What could we do with resources that could be reallocated instead of $100,000 per course of therapy? What could we do with that in the community to improve our quality of life score? That's the question. And this is where, if we don't engage in this conversation, editorial comment, if we don't engage in this conversation, well, then we deserve more rules and regulations that you know, we didn't write. In other words, I am of the view that the answer to the riddle is in this room, in part, that we should be engaged in the conversation. Okay, let me leave part uh, two and say to you, of course, you know, one word that will save your life, and that one word is? No, of course. No, ma, you didn't need that third CAT scan for your hiatal hernia. By the way, Thanksgiving that year, when my mother flew back up to New York to be with her, my brother and me, I said to my kid brother, shut the light, let's see if mom glows in the dark. <laughs> you know, scary.